Good morning. Good morning. Wonderful. You guys know you're in a church environment. I get a response. It's really great. It's really great. You know, we try to merge together here the, uh, the sacred and the uh, secular, and uh, I'm really pleased to see we're in here this morning. Uh, my name is Cheryl Lanza, and on behalf of the United Church of Christ Office of Communication Inc., I am pleased to welcome you to this, the 33rd Annual Everett C. Parker Ethics and Telecommunications Lecture and Award Ceremony. For three decades, we have been celebrating Everett Parker's life and legacy, his work, uh, his life's work. And um, last year, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of his historic petition to the Federal Communications Commission which established the right for citizens to be involved in FCC proceedings, something that we're still benefiting from today. And this year, of course, our gathering is a little bittersweet. And we've lost more than one person in the past year. In April, we lost Charles Benton, who was a 2012 Parker Award recipient and our great champion, and we're so pleased to work with on the Benton Foundation and his family. We also, the UCC family lost Reverend Dr. Michael J. Murphy, who actually spoke at this event in this location two years ago. He just passed away suddenly. But, as you all know, most of all, we're missing Everett Parker himself, who passed away last month at the age of 102. 102 years. He was active up to that last minute. Many of us here were privileged to join the extended Parker family in New York two weeks ago for Everett's uh, memorial service. Uh, and they're from outside of New York City. Um, for those of you who have not, who weren't able to come, we actually brought with us a memorial book here uh, near the reception desk. So if you didn't get to go and you want to pass on your wishes to the Parker family, if you didn't get to do it on your way in, please make sure you look for the book on your way out. And so here we are. It's really nice to be back in a church setting with our group of friends and colleagues as we continue to celebrate Everett's life and honor the people who are gathering on his new work, whether they're involved with what we might call their traditional media or whether they're in new media. Of course, we know those things are really different now. So as we get started to set the stage and to kick us off, um, I want to call Reverend Dr. Sidney Fowler, who is the pastor here at First Congregational United Church of Christ, to lead us in an opening prayer. Good morning, everyone. So very glad you're here today. It's a delight for you to be with us in terms of sharing this very exciting time, a time of memory, a time of celebration of Everett Parker. Uh, this is also just happens to be um, our 150th year here at First Congregational UCC. I invite you when you go grab some food to look at the banner uh, out front a little bit that shares our history from being founded by abolitionists to our days now of uh, continuing to build just and loving community here on this spot. Uh, we've been here for 150 years, even though our buildings have changed uh, throughout time. So we also want to say how grateful we are that you're here today, because your presence uh, becomes part of our history of Gil Levin and help us shape our future. So with much gratitude and so much grace, let us go to God. Wake us up, O oh God, to your newness this day. On this crisp autumn morning, bless each who gathers here and the food we share. Form us into a new community. O oh God, speak out and publish. Promote and give voice to the vulnerable and to all those who long for your good news. Still speak, God. Keep speaking. Keep speaking. On this morning, we continue to speak through Joseph Torres and Wally Bowen, who we honor today. May they feel your presence. Inspire us through their service. On this morning, through Dana Boyd, enliven and create anew your vision, getting a good and just word out in this generation. Bless her. And on this morning, may the memory and work of Everett Parker be among us, teaching, 
inspire me, making bold witness, still speaking, still speaking. So wake us up in this hour to your presence. Keep us diligent in your work, listening for your voice. New every morning, O oh God, is your grace, your blessing, your justice, your good news. In the name of the Holy One, the good word made flesh. Amen. Thank you so much for starting us in that wonderful way. And um, at the UCC, for those of you who are not our members, still speaking is part of our mantra and our ethos, and it means to bring into the modern day the modern interpretation of um, what we've been doing and not, not looking to the past or the interpretation of the scripture, but to keep it vibrant. So the annual Tucker Lecture is a time for all of us, whether we, whether we come from the faith community or social justice action group, whether we work in the corporate sector, the private sector, the public sector, whether we're from Capitol Hill, whether we're working on the FCC, we all recognize how important the media landscape is and how quickly these different technologies are merging into more and more every day. And no matter what brought you here today, we are so happy that you could join us and celebrate the work of those who are before us and reflect the challenges we still face. So this event and the work throughout the year, none of our work would happen without this event and success of it, is our sponsors. Our sponsors are the ones that make this work possible, and we are so, so grateful for that, that sponsorship. It is very special. Um, so I'm going to read off the sponsors, and um, with, you can wave when I name you if you're here, and you can let everybody know where you're sitting, but we're going to hold off on applause until we have it. So um, our lead sponsor, we've just been our lead sponsor for so long, is Comcast NBC Universal, and we're so pleased to have them here. Um, our patrons are the National Association of Broadcasters and the United Church of Christ. That's right. Great, great thanks. And then our corporate special, special friends, we have so many of you and we're so delighted. Uh, the law firm of Best Best and Krieger, the law firm of Kelly, Dry, and Warren, the National Cable and Telecommunications Association, Track Phone Wireless, the law firm of Wiley Ryan. We have two champions this year, Corey Wright and Marvin Morey, who are so gracious to make some personal contributions. Our special friends, DirecTV, the law firm of Wilkinson, Barker, and Downer. And then our non-profit special friends, um, the American Civil Liberties Union, the Benton Foundation, and Intersections International. And really just a round of applause. <laughs> I want to thank uh, folks who have, have come. I see so many previous honorees in our audience. We really appreciate everybody who's been able to participate with us in the past. We must thank our special guests who made it up from Capitol Hill, all the folks who are working to make justice every day, like I said, the FCC staff. So um, we're really, really pleased to, to have you all here. Um, and then if we're going to be thankful, we also have to, we have to thank our, our media planner, Roxanne Ladd, and the staff here in the environment and the first congregation all who made this happen. So um, we are, uh, the one thing I did want to also mention is that the um, uh, hashtag for this event is Parker Lecture 2015. I feel like it's not up there, but if you want to do that, and we are also going to be um, streaming it on Periscope, so hopefully you can all see that um, on online. Now I'm looking for my page, so I'm trying to remember what's the next spot on my script. Oh. 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 Spirituality and views of, of people of her 
presented in our museum. And so we are delighted to welcome Clayton Old Elk, who is a member of the Atalika Pro Pod of Montana. He's a cultural advisor to the museum, and he is going to come up and share a praise song with us from his tradition. Greetings. It's indeed a pleasure and honor to be asked to uh, sing a praise song. I'll just tell you a little bit about uh, the honor of the song in my tribe, the Apsalo Cat. Uh, these are rights that are given to us by our clan fathers in the past town. The way before the age of technology, newspapers, media, we relied on the uh, cat tribes, the Tom tribes, for our limits. In that, uh, we still carry on these traditions in, in most tribes. In my tribe, we have solo cat. We carry this on and take it very hard to heart. And in that, uh, my grand grandfather, when I was uh, a child, each of us are given Indian name, our identity, if you will. My grandfather from the Greasy Mouth tribe, or clan, honored me with my identity, my Indian name. Fights on water, rocket engine. He served in World War II on the battleship in the Pacific and he survived. And he told us war stories and he gave me a name. And along with that, he gave me a praise song. It's a blessing song, it's an honor song. Whenever our colleagues, our members, do good, do well, we call upon our clan fathers and our elders to sing these praise songs in honor of the one that's being honored. So that uh, they can carry on our traditions from the values that we cherry. In this regard, I've been asked by the National Union of American Indian which I'm an advisor and a cultural representative for them as well. One of our colleagues is being recognized today is Dana Boy, and we're very proud uh, of her and her work. And in trying to uh, seek equality and do things that are right, and the museum is a display of doing that. I'm only, not only going to honor her, but all of the recipients today. So all of you, Praying in my first language, the Crow language, the Absalomia. And after that, I will sing my praise song. So if you can and if you will, please rise and pray with me in your own language. Well, I'll tell you something. I'll be interested in the name of the guy who is taking a whole bag of them. Don't think they put up with it. Any thought for free making it to be given. To be given, to be given. Don't think they put a little church from all that again. But then you get a little church from all that again. A little church from all that again. But you know, where's your father? He's like, he's about. And he's like, he's like, he's like, he's like, where's your father? He's like, I'm not sure what I'm like. He's like, I'm not sure what I'm like. 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 Creator of all things, thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for allowing us to get together to carry on our traditions and the way we believe in the spirituality that's been embedded in all of us.
standing alongside our, our Muslim friends uh, when they were facing another round of hateful attacks. And I saw in some pictures of some of the solidarity events a great teacher that said, the UCC, we pray well with others. And I'm really pleased um, for Clayton to come and pray well with us. That was, that was very beautiful. So now we are going to hear from the Reverend Dr. John Dorhauer, who will share a few words about Everett Park Grant's legacy. Reverend Dorhauer is our General Minister and President. He's the head of the UCC, and we're delighted to have him join us so soon. He was just elected this summer to lead our denomination. Thank you. Thank you. It really is an honor to be here. It's my first Parker lecture. Way back in March, when I was nominated, I started getting requests from all over the country to appear. But when I saw this invitation, it was one of the first, if not the first, to go on my calendar. I came to the United Church of Christ after eight years in another seminary from another tradition. And in 1985, I started learning about the United Church of Christ. And one of the first stories that was told to me was the story of Everett Parker and what he did to transform the landscape of communication access in America for small communities. I can remember my spiritual father, the man I call my spiritual father, the Reverend Dr. Sam Mann, before I even met him. It's in a small church 50 miles from the big city, and I can just barely pick up his radio show, The View from East of Truths. No national broadcasting company would air what he was saying, and it transformed me. And it was an honor that four years ago, I was approached while in Phoenix by a small local access station and spent the last four years in Phoenix broadcasting my own show Ever made that happen. I never met the man, but I wasn't going to miss this. Last year, when OCE joined the museum in marking the 50th anniversary of Reverend Parker's historic petition to the FCC, we recall many of the details of that battle. It took courage to go into the deep south of the early 60s and openly establish and openly challenge the white establishment of Jackson, Mississippi took vision to chart a pathway to success. First, it was over the ownership of WLBT TV, and later, after Everett established the principle that members of the community had a role in determining how our public airwaves were used, that vision widened to include issues of content, diversity and employment, and whether those valuable resources would be used to educate and inform. It also took perseverance. <clears throat> That's a certain amount of stubbornness to see the battle through. I know there are many here today who were protégés of Everett Parker and who studied the WLBT case in law school. And Charles Benton was honored with the Parker Award three years ago. He called on several of those protégés to help him describe how Everett served as a role model for all of them. Andy Schwartzman pointed to three things he learned from Everett. First, do not be afraid of difficult challenges. Second, you need patience. It takes a long time to accomplish these things. And third, the work has to be driven by an ethic. Regarding that ethic, Everett once said, if you really believe what the Bible says, and I do, you have to. If you have any ground to stand on or any resources to use that you can help people who are voiceless, you have to do it if you are to act as a Christian. And Everett concluded, I think that's what drives me. Unlike others for whom strong, strong rhetoric was enough, Everett always looked for action that mattered. He was one who got things done and his commitment to ensuring that every marginal voice would have access to the airwaves not only mattered, not only matters still, but was something almost every other justice advocate, advocate missed. He did not. When I took office just a couple of months ago, I said there were two themes that I wanted to focus on during my tenure as president and general minister of the UCC, and both of them touch on the work that engages us here today. 
First, I want to call on our denomination to consider new ways of being church, of, if you will, bringing the secular and the sacred into the same space. At a time when there is declining interest in institutional religion, <coughs> new technologies give us many tools to help make that happen. And it's important that we find ways to make those technologies both affordable and accessible to all. It was a delight listening to Mike and Tony talk about what Comcast is doing last night. They told us the story of what they're doing to make that digital technology accessible in the poorest communities in this country. I also want our denomination to continue to ask tough questions about the impact of white privilege in this country. I did my doctoral work in white privilege, learning from the man I call my spiritual father, the Reverend Dr. Sam Mann. A page from the history of media justice, which is a particular passion of one of our honorees, Joe Torres, explains why this is so important. When the Kerner Commission issued its civil rights, its report on civil disorders in 1968, as Everett's legal battle was still winding its way through the courts, the commission wrote, quote, if what the white American reads in the newspapers or sees on television conditions his or her expectation of what is ordinary and normal in the larger society, and he or she will neither understand or accept the black American. By failing to portray the Negro as a matter of routine and in the context of the total society, the news media have, we believe, contributed to the black-white schism in this country, unquote. Those are words we should continue to ponder today, not only as it applies to African Americans, but all people of color and groups whose numbers are so often presented as outsiders in the American media. Near the end of his life, Everett Parker was asked how he would like to be remembered, and he replied, I want them to remember that I was a guy who fought like the devil for the rights of minorities. We do remember. And this event gives us a chance to rededicate ourselves to continue that fight. We are all sad over Edward's passing. And at the same time, we celebrate the long life and the long life of advocacy that he was able to live. Now it's my honor and pleasure to call on Truman Parker, my colleague in ministry and Edward's son, to share a few remarks on behalf of his family. Truman. service about two weeks ago, and my family asked Garth Cribs to uh, sort of take a piece of the, serve, of the service and say something about my father. If you don't know him, Art was one of my father's successors in the Office of Communication. And Art started his talk with the question, how many of you suffered under Edward? <laughs> <laughs> and then he called out people like Andy Schwartzman and Cheryl over there who were important parts of his work and mentioned how important they were. If you didn't know my father, you might think that Art perhaps was being a bit rude in an inappropriate place, but if you ever worked with my father, you know exactly what he was talking about. To say that dad could be difficult would be a colossal understatement. He was demanding, he was impatient, he always wanted everything 10 minutes ago, even if he had just handed out the assignment. That being said, he was as demanding on himself as he was on others, and he always had a vision of what he wanted, what he wanted, and why he wanted it. And he had an amazing ability to bring out the talent and the creativity in other people, and I might add, including me. Most of the comments of his career two weeks ago centered on his confrontation with the, w, with the FCC and WLBT. And I had imagined that most people here know that story at least as well as I do, if not better. So this morning I'd like to address some of the as other aspects of his career, which is amazingly multidimensional. Most of his 
confrontation with the burning bush can be interpreted in a number of different ways. But one interpretation is that the bush was always there, that it was always there burning merrily next to the path. It was only Moses who saw it, and only Moses who turned aside to figure out what this anomaly was. Like Moses, my father had an uncanny knack of noticing things that other people overlooked. He published the first study on religious programming and broadcasting and radio in the 1930s. It was short, it was primitive, it was published in the Chicago Theological Review, so it probably didn't make much of a splash. But the logs he developed to make that study became the basis of the ones he used to monitor WLBT in the middle 60s. In the late 1950s, my father, along with Dave Berry and Alice Smythe, published one of the first major studies of religious programming being in the newest mass media and television. And that study remains a classic. He created the first denominational public relations department, not just this country, it seemed that the world had seen. And when I was a kid, he employed a cooking service. One of the ways I learned the names of most of the newspapers in the United States is I had to sort the clippings into stories and into newspapers. And even now, I'm amazed at how much publicity and ink he got for the United Church of Christ. He was a true natural in the trade of reporting and in public relations. He also loved directing and producing. He began his career in high school producing a program for striking teachers in Chicago that allowed them to tell their side of the story why they were striking and were involved in this labor dispute. Later when he worked in radio professionally in Chicago, he produced a children, uh, children's program for the Lutheran Radio Hour that was called All Aboard for Adventure. He used to have those big 18, 20 inch records down in our basement. In the 1950s and 60s, he produced a similar television program for the United Church of Christ, which he called Off to Adventure. In some ways, the program was primitive. In Africa, the script writer, Norm Lopesens, arrived on site a couple of weeks before the production crew. Norm wrote a script to move on, and the crew came in and shot it. Dad brought me along on that trip. And without consulting my father, Norm wrote me into one of the episodes he wrote about Boy Scouts in the Congo, which is, by the way, one of the reasons why I'm not in media. <laughs> and uh, Dad did off to adventure series in Japan, in Africa, in Alaska, and he also did a series on Native Americans. And he worked really hard not to be stereotypical. Also, parenthetically, I can tell you, he did one program on the workers who worked on high steel in New York. And one, he never looked at a New York building in the same way again. And two, he never walked underneath the construction site again. When I, when I was in college, I screened the program that had been made about the Boy Scouts in the Congo. And I was in college, and I was studying media, and I thought the program was a little crude. And I thought it was a little crude until about two years later when the New York PBS station ran retrospectives on classic American television in the 1950s. As far as the as production values were concerned, the Office of Communication put out a product that was just as good as and sometimes better as what came across commercial television. Later, Dad and Pickle, the distinguished theologian, Dr. Roger Shin, into hosting a program called Tangled World, in which Dr. Shin discussed ethical issues and ethical problems. And even later, he produced a cartoon movie called The Pumpkin Coach about missions. And our basement was full of cartoon cells for years. In his middle 80s and well into his 90s, he produced and directed a local cable program in White Plains that he called Views from the Cubes, where we had an interview or interview different people to 
throughout the town. Another part of his career, and one I think that he was probably most proud of, maybe even more than WWT, was his influence on hiring and broadcasting. As he told the story, he pressured some FCC officials to start enforcing the recently enacted EEO laws, and the official responded along the lines that, well, that's what the commission would really like to do, but they didn't have the data, and they just didn't have the information to be able to go ahead with doing that. My father said, what do you mean you don't have the data? Every station supplies a 395 form, which goes to you. You got it. And the guy shrugged his shoulder and said, yeah, well, they had the form, but you know, we didn't have the budget to analyze it. So my father said, so what are you doing with the forms? The official said, well, we're stacking them up in a room somewhere. My father said, send them to my office. So the official called his bluff, and a couple of weeks later, we started having a lot of boxes of 395 forms come into the office in New York. In the fall of 1972, the Office of Communication published a commercial television station that employment practices and the composition of boards of directors, the status of minority and women. And then in January of 1973, it published a twin study on employment in the public television stations. I worked on both of those studies, doing the grunt work, opening up the envelopes, recording numbers by hand, collating the raw numbers on a primitive electronic calculator. I'd never seen one before. And I will tell you, I have a copy of that, of those studies. There is blood on every single page of them, and not a little of it belongs to me. But they changed the face of American broadcasting, and they changed hiring practices in American broadcasting. They changed what you saw on the air, and all of our exangulation was worth all of the blood that we shed on it. My father told me that the meeting he had with broadcasting executives, he was accused of throwing his weight around, and they said, well, Dr. Clark, if we had the budget you had, we could do the kind of things you're doing, too. And Dad looked at him and at them and said, gentlemen, the entire yearly budget for my office, including the public relations work we do for the denomination, the entire budget wouldn't purchase a minute of time on the Super Bowl. And there was real truth to that claim. One time when my father's office staff was lined up to donate blood, a denominational official, those who remember Ruby Shears, came by and looked at them and said, I always heard that Parker demanded blood from his people, but I never thought anyone would do it literally. Dad had another great career as a teacher, and he was a good one. He was a professor at Yale Divinity School, and later on, after he retired from the Office of Communication, a professor of communication policy at Fordham University. He was a very good writer and a, and a superior editor, and he never worked with him on writing. He had a delightful sense of humor. He was always fun to be with. He recognized his flaws and foibles, and he was one of those people who could laugh at himself. He passionately loved my mother, as well as my family. My cousin once commented to me, Uncle Everett and Aunt Geneva are the only couple I know who after 30 years of marriage still look like they're on their honeymoon. And indeed, at one point, when they'd been married about 20 years, they checked into a hotel, and 20 minutes after they arrived, there was a knock on the door, and someone delivered a bottle of champagne and a bouquet of flowers, and my father said, what's this? And the guy said, well, we always give flowers and wine to newlyweds. <laughs> I might add that my mother was a really important part of his career. Not only was she just as smart as my father was, but she was made of far, far tougher material. And more than most people realize, she kept him in check. And as anyone who worked with him knows, he needed to be kept in check. My father was richly blessed. 
He lived a long and full life. He enjoyed causing all of the trouble he created for all of the different institutions he created it for, the church, the courts, the FCC, the broadcasting industry, his children. He managed to irritate a whole long line of people and loved every single bit of it. He loved to be the center of attraction. I'm an ordained minister. I was raised by a radio broadcaster. I'm acutely aware of how long things last, particularly how long worship services last. When we planned his memorial service, I looked at what we had and it was running far too long and I said, you've run for two hours, you can't do this. My daughter said, Dad, it's Granddad's funeral service. It'll be all about him. He would have loved being the center of attraction for a whole bunch of people for two full hours. We still got the service cut down. I will tell you, he would have loved to have been here this morning, and he would have loved to have been the center of attraction here this morning. We thank all of you for being here and for celebrating his career.
While broadband is nearly ubiquitous among high-income households, the adoption rate among households earning less than $25,000 is only 47%. When so many government jobs, services, and educational opportunities and resources are tied to the internet, this access is critical if we're going to succeed in reducing income disparities that exist in America today. And now it's time for us to focus on the persons we are privileged to honor here today. It's with great honor for us to give the Donald H. McGannon Award to Wally Bowen today. Even if Wally could not be here in person to receive